very swiftly, um, we want to now get a slightly different experience. Um, we are getting to understand a lot about um, the technology involved in finally de delivering the packaging and processing that we need um, to move forward. But it's also nice to get a, a picture of what is happening on the ground here in Africa. And uh, we have uh, Michael Arnoldus, he's the MD Sense Consulting Netherlands, and uh, he wants to share um, a presentation on technology transfer, um, lessons from potato and mango um, in Africa. I think, you know, for me, I'm, I've been working in, um, in Africa now for about 10 years, in uh, a, lot, a lot of time in processing. Technical stuff like the last presentation is still science fiction for most people that I work with. I typically come into small factories in West Africa, East Africa, where people have a bag, foot, seal, uh, foot sealer, and they're manually sealing little bags to sell on the local market, um, you know, with some kind of plastic sachet that they find in a Chinese shop. They don't even know what the material is of the sachet. Um, and then, of course, you get all sorts of quality issues, and the, the, the question then is how do you upgrade these uh, processes? So um, I just wanted to share with you in, in terms of the, the, the theme of the day, technology transfer. Um, okay, how do you now move from somebody with a very simple foot sealer to somebody who can actually use barrier technology in packaging? Um, so very quickly, who, who, who is Sense? Uh, we are a consultancy um, who are busy in development in agricultural value chains in mostly Africa. So we do farming, processing, uh, marketing, the whole value chain, uh, business plan development for entrepreneurs, um, development strategies for uh, development organizations, uh, governments, embassies, um, and also finance is a large part of our work. How do you, as a processor, find the finance to upgrade, expand, or even as a farmer to mechanize your farming? Um, some clients that, that, are, that we work for, World Bank, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, GIZ from Germany, IFED, USAID, uh, businesses, those are some of our clients. Okay, when we talk about uh, technology transfers and about processing and packaging, the first step is actually to find the real issues and opportunities and, and how to choose the right technology. Because there's a whole range of technologies here, um, and even out there in the world, there's many more technologies when it goes to processing and farming, but how do you find out what is the right technology for you? Do you need to go to China, India, European equipment, local equipment? What is it that you're going to use? And before you can make a choice, you need to find out what your real problem is. Um, now, what is actually technology transfer? Uh, you know, we are talking about the copying and adaptation of production, processing, storage, and transport technology from one country to the other or from one um, sector to the other. So here in Africa, you're usually talking about taking European, German packaging technology and making it work in your country, which is not as simple as one-on-one -on -one taking a machine, putting it in your factory, and, and it will work. And that's where the, the problems come in. Um, we're also talking about not only about technology, um, uh, the main equipment and the complementary equipment, a packaging machine, but also the generator that comes with it, etc. But technology transfer is also a lot, a lot about usage skills, knowledge, how to use a machine, how to run a production process, how to run a factory, um, and repair and maintenance capacity. It's all good buying a nice new machine, but if no one can repair it in your country, no one can maintain it, you have a big problem. So technology transfer, you know, when we bring in new technology, uh, like, for example, mango dryers, meat dryers, cereal dryers into West Africa, you need to build a local maintenance uh, capacity. Otherwise, the machine is going to break down, it's going to be put in the corner, and people will stop using it. Um, and packaging technology and making it work in your country, which is not as simple as one-on-one -on -one taking a machine, putting it in your factory, and, and it will work. And that's where the, the problems come in. Um, we're also talking about not only about technology, um, uh, the main equipment and the complementary equipment, a packaging machine, but also the generator that comes with it, etc. But technology transfer is also a lot about usage skills, knowledge how to use a machine, how to run a production process, how to run a factory, um, and repair and maintenance capacity. It's all good buying a nice new machine, but if no one can repair it in your country, no one can maintain it, you have a big problem. So technology transfer, you know, when we 
bring in new technology, uh, like for example mango dryers, meat dryers, cereal dryers into West Africa, you need to build a local maintenance uh, capacity. Otherwise, the machine is going to break down, it's going to be put in the corner, and people will stop using it. Um, and perhaps the, you know, the total end goal would be local technology manufacturing. Why keep importing equipment? At some stage, as an economy, I think you need to move on to manufacturing your own equipment. Um, what are the main challenges in Africa for technology transfer? The first thing, I think, is the small scale of production. People here talk about kilos, tons, whereas a European factory, hundreds of tons. Um, the capacity of the market to absorb products, the capacity to manage a large factory, um, is something you need to develop. And uh, typically, you know, the, the difference in scale is huge. A lot of the machinery is not usable because your scale of production is too small. So finding the right machinery for your scale is, is definitely a, a challenge. Language is a big challenge. I work a lot in Mozambique. Francophone West Africa, people do not speak English. Therefore, understanding you know, technology machines is very difficult and even doing simple importing. Um, a different business culture. Uh, people want to negotiate, but a lot of suppliers, they give you a fixed quote and that's what it is. is, what it is. Um, harsh climates. Your climates here are very harsh. Dry, hot, dusty. How does equipment deal with that? Um, the local presence of suppliers, your, uh, suppliers of a lot of technology are very far away. It's not easy to go and see a machine that works, uh, to see an example, go see a supplier, visit the model in its factory because it's very far away. Um, and it also means, you know, spare parts need to maybe flown in or, or who is going to repair it. Um, limited supply, not only of the main equipment, also the equipment that you need to run. Uh, you can have a dryer, but where are you going to get your plastic crates? Um, when I work in West Africa, everything needs to be imported. Even the, the wash basins where you, you, know, you put your foot on and you wash your hands to get a HACCP certification, they don't have it locally. It needs to be imported. Um, it's just not available local. Um, limited technical skills for use and repair. Where do you find the few people who can actually repair a machine, who know, who are, you know, are real electricians, um, and then the unreliability of water and electricity. Uh, typically when we do processing here, it's bring your own infrastructure. You need to have your own generator, your voltage stabilizer. You need to have your own well. Uh, and all of this is, is important to make your machines run. Um, expensive transport, high import duties are big issues. I'm doing some work in Tanzania now where you need to pay 18% VAT on all the equipment that you uh, import. How do you make a business case work in those circumstances? How are you competitive? Um, and then poor maintenance mentality is not a big issue. Uh, you generally do maintenance when the thing is broken. But the idea that you do maintenance to prevent something from breaking is not always there. Um, so what do we normally do when we pick technology? You definitely have uh, an analysis phase where you really try to find not even what technology do I need, but what am I going to produce for which market? Um, you, fo you formulate a program, how are you going to introduce it, you implement, you evaluate, and then you try to replicate it elsewhere in Africa or a different, uh, different sector. Now, the biggest thing, the biggest difficulty with technology is to find where are your real issues in your production process. Is it your packaging? Is it your frying of your potatoes? Where does your real issue come in? And how do you now choose then the right technology for you? And for me, you know, technology doesn't determine your product. It shouldn't determine your production process. Technology is, in the end, an outcome of your market. What are the market opportunities? The context of your country, your climate, how do you operate? Um, the skills of an entrepreneur. And, and your supply, you know, how stable is your supply? Do you have enough supply? What is the quality of your raw material? And all of those things then determine the choice for your technology. Uh, if you have a, a quality of milk that's inferior, you need to put something in your production line to improve the quality before you can do aseptic packaging. 
if you do aseptic packaging, you still have a lot of bacteria in your pack, uh, you won't get your one year shelf life of your long life milk, for example. So you need to adapt. Um, if your market uh, doesn't want pouches, you can have a great pouch filler for your milk, uh, but you should have a Tetra Pak box because that's what the consumer wants. Um, but, you know, I find a lot of people, a lot of times people let themselves being, th they follow the technology. They say, this is the technology that we want, and therefore this is the product we're going to make. Um, so when you choose technology, you should really start with market research. What is it that the consumer really wants? And from there, you work backwards to that is what does that then mean for my raw material supply, and what does that then mean for the technology that I need? Uh, that I need? Does the client want the pouch? Do they want a tray, a sealed tray for your meat? What is it that they want? Um, is there a seasonality issue where you need to perhaps stock materials because your supply is coming in one season but your demand is in another season? Uh, that means you maybe need a longer shelf life for your packaging. Um, then your supply analysis. What is happening with your raw material? Do you have enough raw material? When does it come in the year? Um, do you have affordable prices? Does it come at the right time? And in the end, you still need to ask yourself, does it make sense for me to invest in this industry? If I need all this expensive machinery, is this really a good business case or not? And that should really be, I think, the first step. Now, what I see a lot is um, what I call the two most common agro-processing myths. Um, and one case that I always come, again, uh, come up with is the, um, uh, the tomato paste factory in Africa. It's a classic. And the story always goes like this. We have a lot of tomatoes. And um, you can pick them up for next to nothing on the side of the road. Um, and everyone eats tomato paste, so we should build a tomato paste factory. But what are the real issues? Um, first of all, they're not the right type of tomatoes. They're not suitable for processing. They are only coming two months of the year. Um, the logistics to get them to your factory is immensely complicated because they're on bad rural roads all over the area. And actually, in the end, uh, you cannot outcompete the Italian, Chinese, Spanish producers of tomato paste. They are able to produce at such a big scale that they land that little tin of tomato paste at a price you can never make. So before you put out the factory, do your analysis properly of your supply in your market to avoid our nice white elephant, this beautiful factory with state-of-the-art equipment that just stands idle. Um, then you need to do, once you're convinced this is a good business, you need to do your production processing analysis. Um, you know, for example, what is the current processing technology that you use? What is going wrong with it? What is your cost price structure? And then what should it be? Um, and then also ask yourself, you know, if I look at my supply, is the technology really the issue? Or do I have a marketing problem? Or do I have a supply problem? Is technology really the issue? Um, and if it is, what technology do I need? And is it likely to succeed if I take it from somewhere else? Or do I need to develop my own? And some, a, a tool that I use a lot to really identify your issues is your... Um, cost price analysis and your benchmarking. Um, you simply start calculating, okay, where are my costs sitting in my, in my, produ in my products? Um, and in this example, we see that 41% of the cost price of a kilogram of crisps in Kenya is your potatoes, and 27% is your oil. Labor is 1%, spice is 4%, and packaging is, um, what is it, 19%. So where are you going to work? on your potatoes, of course, because that's 41% of your cost price. Don't waste time on technology that's going to save your labor, because your labor is only 1% of your cost price. Your labor is not your problem. Your problem is your potatoes and your oil, and those are the first ones that you should be working on. Can you, maybe with technology or working with your suppliers, increase your efficiency so that you need fewer potatoes for one kilogram of crisps? Less oil for one kilogram of crisps. And then benchmarking is also interesting. Uh, so for potato crisps, for example, we benchmark with South Africa and with Europe um, to see how many kilos of potatoes does Europe need for one kilogram of crisps? How much does South Africa need? Where is Kenya sitting? Not only on quantity, but also on prices. Uh, oil, for example, as well. 
And what do you find? The oil consumption here in Kenya is much higher than it is in South Africa, and the price of oil is two to three times as high. Packaging material is three times as high here in Kenya for your nice foil, for your crisp bags, than it is in South Africa. So those give you the areas where you need to work on. Um, and in the case of, uh, of oil, it has to do with the machinery that's in the production process, but also the quality of the potatoes that goes in. Uh, if you blanch and steam your potatoes before you put them in the fryer, if you dry them properly, you will use less oil, also less energy to heat the oil. Um, what you can also do is a what-if analysis, because the question is often, is it economically feasible to do a certain activity? Um, and then you have to say to yourself, okay, currently my cost price is too high for what I can get in the market. But now what if I manage to solve this problem? What if I manage to go from five kilos of potatoes to four kilos of potatoes? If I manage to reduce my oil consumption with 10%, am I actually profitable then? If the question is yes, you have a scope to work on it. If you still won't be profitable, you need to look for a different activity because you can buy all those nice machines, but you're still not going to be able to be competitive. Um, so in this particular case, we have the cost price of a kilogram of frozen uh, chips. And in Kenya, even if you do a lot of improvements and you invest in your technology, you get to $89 cents for a kilo of frozen chips. And the EU benchmark is $68 cents. And... Um, Potato crisps are also more expensive here to produce, but you know what the difference is between potato crisps and frozen chips? You can fit 1.2 tons of crisps in a container, but 20 tons of frozen chips. So frozen chips are exported worldwide, and you really are competing with European factories that do a minimum of 15 tons per hour. And here people are producing 100 kgs per hour. So you see that's a very difficult uh, case to compete. So frozen chips in Kenya is just not a good business, whereas crisps is a very good business. That's the reason you find all these local crisp brands here in your supermarkets doing very well. They're more expensive to produce, the technology is not optimal, but you can't transport it. And in the end, I think it's important to uh, define strategic options. And now my doesn't seem to be going on. Ah, there we go. Oh, we have some technical issues here. That could be the Mac to uh, Microsoft conversion. Okay, what is a strategic option? A strategic option is a type of product for a specific client with a specific technology. And that is what you build your business model around. You need to be very clear. What are you going to produce for whom with which technology? Are you going to produce crisps for the local middle class market in Kenya with a European um, automatic crisp lines? Are you going to do dried mango for a European market with a South African mango dryer? You, know? you need to have a clear idea where are you going. Um, and then if you now look at different technologies, um, what are the things that you need to consider when you are comparing technologies? First of all, the quality of the finished product. That is the most important. You can buy a very nice technology, but if you don't get the quality product that your consumer wants, you're, you're investing in the wrong thing. Pouch machine, beautiful, but if your customer wants the box, you have a problem. If you don't get the nice crispy potato out of the fryer, it may be a very energy efficient fryer, but you're going to have a problem. Um, your processing efficiency. How efficient is the technology that you're choosing? How many kilos of raw material do you need for a kilogram of finished product? Um, your investment cost, how expensive is this machine? Your operating cost, how much energy does your machine use? Um, how much labor do I need to have to operate this machine? Uh, how much is the maintenance and repairs going to cost? What's the price of spare parts? And then another one is resilience to local conditions. Does this high-tech machine work in my production hall where it's 45 degrees, um, humidity is 100%, um, I can see things rusting you know, that are a week old. Do I need this? Does that technology work here? Uh, how sensitive is it to dust? Um, and a very big thing, very important thing is the right scale. How does the scale of the machine 
fit to the size of my market, the size of my supply, my ambitions as an entrepreneur, uh, but also my ability to manage a certain scale of a factory. Yeah. And if you look at frozen chips, actually the minimum size of, of a production line is two and a half tons per hour. You can never make that work here, where your supply is erratic, your market is just not there for that scale. Crisps, on the other hand, the minimum scale is 200 kgs per hour. That is manageable. That's what, what the factories here in Kenya are sitting at. And, uh, you know, then it's still a, a limited size factory. You, you can manage it. Um, supply and service spare parts I've already talked about. And also the complexity. Can we find the people who understand this machine and are able to operate it? When we looked at mango drying in West Africa, we also chose to not have a whole range of automatic features on there because the sensors are very sensitive. And it's, we found it's too difficult for the operators to understand. If everything is happening automatically, it's fine. They push the button, it goes. But it doesn't force them to really understand the process. And that then enables them to understand when something goes wrong, what the cause is. So we actually find it's better to have a more manual machine. Um, Then we look at different technology suppliers. Where do you get your machines from? Are you going to get them from India, from Europe, or um, uh, the US, from India, uh, Brazil, maybe South Africa? They all have their advantages. And you need to look very well at that. Price is very important. And China tends to be very cheap. But the quality, the service, it's an issue. You need to go there physically to see the factory to make sure that what you get, you can use. The same is usually true for India, who well, although it's improving. Um, EU equipment, generally very good, but it is extremely expensive. South Africa, you can find a lot of assembly, specialized for different things, tends to be quite hardy, um, works reasonably well, but the, you know, the types of technology and offer is quite limited. So they all have their advantages, and you need, need to look very critically at, at the source. And the amount of machines that I see that were purchased because they were cheap and they're not working or they, they break down and there's no service follow-up is, is very high. Um, so in the end, I still end, tend to end up a lot with European, US equipment or South African, uh, Brazilian equipment. Then something else which is maybe not relevant for you, I think most people here are business owners, but more for donors, is the, the right beneficiaries and modalities. And I find when I work, um, you need to work with real entrepreneurs. If you give a machine to a women's group or a cooperative, most of the time it's not being used properly. You need to have a local entrepreneur that puts its own money in it. And it can be a bit subsidized if it's new technology and you want to test it in a place. But somebody needs to put their own money in it to make sure that they feel the pain if the machine doesn't work. Because if not, if they don't do so, at the first sign of a problem, they'll put the machine in a corner, they will stop using it and go back to their old ways. And you learn absolutely nothing about how this technology works in a place. But if their money is in it, they cannot afford to stop with it. And they are now forced to, to solve the problems and make it work and invest a little bit more and tweak it. And then you're starting to innovate and adapt the technology to a local situation. Um, so as I said, you know, for me, cooperatives and women's group it's been very difficult uh, to, to, to test technology. The scale of production is not there. The seriousness is just not there to really are committed to, to testing things. And it's not easy. Testing new technology takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It goes wrong very easily. And when it does go wrong, you lose a whole dryer full of fresh mango that you've bought and you've invested labor to cut it. Uh, you, you, you lose a whole batch of potatoes because you're not frying it properly and you have to throw it away. Um, Large corporations often also difficult because they, um, you know, they want to have an instant solution and it often doesn't work that way. So often I find SMEs is the right, you know, mode to to to, to test new technologies. Now there's two cases that I have um, that I could quickly go into, but I'm not sure how are we for time. I'm looking at my moderator. Sorry. Ten more minutes. Okay, who prefers mango and who would prefer potato? Who many, how many people vote for mango? One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
And who wants to see potato? We have more potato people. Okay. So then what I'll do is I'll move a bit into potato. I need to do a lot of Okay, so what we did in, in, in Kenya is we looked into potato processing and potato farming. And we tried to see what's, how can we modernize things. Um, and uh, though the initial focus was on, on, on potato farmers, um, from the start I said, okay, if you want to do mechanization of potato farmers, you need to know whether there's a secure market. That means working with the processors, understanding where is the potato going, at which prices, What's the development there? You know, uh, is there a secure market? So what we did actually, we did market research for crisps, uh, for frozen chips, fresh cut chips. Uh, we looked at current farming practices. What are they doing now? What's going wrong? What's the optimal thing? Um, we looked at the different business models for processing. Uh, what's the economics of producing crisps in this country? What's the economics of producing uh, fresh cut chips for canned chick, for steers, for chicken in. Um, we also looked at what would be, given their types of business, the right processing equipment for a crisp producer, for a frozen chips producer, for a small scale fresh cut chip person delivering two steers, uh, chicken in, but also for farmers. Given the size of the farmers, the type of farmers, what type of factors do they need? Um, and then finally, we looked into the financing aspect. Okay, can you get it financed? If this is the investment, $150,000 for a package of farmers, who wants to finance it? Is it local banks, an investment fund? Under which conditions? And are they willing to invest? So now, the context of the Kenyan potato sector, you're very far away from the screen, so I'll have to take you through it. Basically, if you compare Kenya with the Netherlands and South Africa, you have about six and a half we also looked at what would be, given their types of business, the right processing equipment for a crisp producer, for a frozen chips producer, for a small scale fresh cut chip person delivering two steers, uh, chicken in, but also for farmers. Given the size of the farmers, the type of farmers, what type of factors do they need? Um, and then finally, we looked into the financing aspect. Okay, can you get it financed? If this is the investment, $150,000 for a package of farmers, who wants to finance it? Is it local banks, an investment fund? Under which conditions? And are they willing to invest? So now, the context of the Kenyan potato sector, you're very far away from the screen, so I'll have to take you through it. Basically, if you compare Kenya with the Netherlands and South Africa, you have about six and a half million tons of potatoes produced in the Netherlands, 2.2 in South Africa, and Kenya, two and a half million tons. So you produce a lot of potatoes here. But now, only 1% of your potatoes here is processed. Whereas in the Netherlands, 62% of potatoes of, is processed. And in South Africa, you're looking at 12%. Your yield per hectare is around 42, 44 tons in other countries. And here, you're sitting at 7 um, to 9 tons per hectare. And you have 900,000 farmers versus 579 farmers in South Africa and uh, about 11,000, if I remember properly, in, uh, in the Netherlands. So a lot of farmers, very small acreage, very low yields, and almost nothing gets processed. That's, that's the local context. Um, using maybe five varieties of potatoes, whereas in other countries you use two to 300 varieties of potatoes. So you know that's where you're sitting. You're sitting really at the start of a development. Processing is growing fast, but it, it, from where you start is very low. Um, what we do see in the supermarkets is, um, let's say, a market for 2,500 to 3,000 tons of industrially produced crisps. So I'm talking about properly packaged crisps, you know, manufactured in an industrial environment, 100, 200 kilograms an hour, semi-automatic production lines. Supermarkets are full of crisps. It's big business. It's growing fast. Everyone in, uh, in the Kenyan middle class eats potato crisps at least once a week. Um, your fast food industry is also growing tremendously fast. And hotels and fast food places, they, they do not want to cut their own uh, chips. It's dirty work. They don't want to manage it. They'd rather get a supplier to come in every day with a batch of 100 kilos of fresh cut chips. They don't want to do it themselves. And that market is growing tremendously. 
And um, what we actually see is that the margins on these products are very good for retailers, for processors, etc. cetera. Um, but if you want to have good crisps and good chips, you need good quality potatoes. And that means for chips, for example, you need a nice long potato with no eyes in it, no blemishes, no diseases, no problems. Because uh, your hotel doesn't want to have the small chips, so you need nice potatoes. Crisps, you need a nice round potato, and they also need to have a specific flavor, uh, dry matter content, etc. And what we see here is that those potatoes are very expensive. You pay twice as much for a processing potato in Kenya as you do for a table potato. Whereas in other countries, processing potatoes are cheaper. So what we fr saw from that is actually there is a tremendous business opportunity as a farmer to supply it to the processing industry. You can get a very good price. You have a very secure market. Also because your client can't go anywhere. If I cut my fresh cut chips, I can't go to the open market for a bag of potato because I'll find some nice potatoes on top and two-thirds of the bag will be what they call rotten golf balls. This small, it's rotten, you cannot make chips out of it. So they're kind of hooked in. So what we said, listen, if we look at the volumes that go into the industry, 15 to 25 tons uh, per day for chips factories, 25 to uh, 32 tons per day for four crisp factories. Um, the prices, you know, is a very good business opportunity for farmers in potato processing industry. But what we currently see is that the yields are very low. And why is that? It's because they don't use the right chemicals and fertilizer. Um, they had a poor quality seed potato. They use substandard soil uh, and seed bed preparation. They harvest manually, 30% of their potatoes is stuck in the ground, the people don't take it out of the ground. When they do it manually, they, har they damage the potatoes. Um, they don't plow properly. So there's a whole range of things that they're doing wrong in the, in the, in the, pr in the production um, that makes it to have a very high, y low yield. And actually, if you look at the economics of potato farming, it's barely profitable here, despite the high prices. And it's only really profitable because they do not calculate their own labor and their family labor. Um, but if you do it properly, you can get to 35 tons per hectare within a few years. And then you have a hugely profitable business case. And even at a modest price and 15 tons per hectare, you have a very profitable business. So then we looked in what would then be the right type of equipment, the right type of technology for a local farmer. And then you get to maybe 75, 80, 95 horsepower tractors, special German uh, fertilizer spreaders, um, harvesters, rotary tillers, a whole range of, of equipment that you can turn easily on small plots, even on a one acre plots um, that are very strong, don't break down easily, etc. And the total investment package for a farmer would be $166,000, including some seed storage, etc. Um, now, we also looked then into the question okay, is that realistic? A farmer spending $166,000 on a set of tractor and implements, you know, is that, uh, is that going to work? Um, well, what we actually found is that um, potato farming is very capital intensive, but your costs are actually sitting, um, I'm just gonna, your, your farming costs are actually driven by your inputs. So these equipments are very expensive, but if you look at your production costs, about 53 to 57% of your cost of production is not the tractor, the depreciation on the tractor, the interest rate at 20% interest, your maintenance on your tractor, your fuel, your driver. All of that is a very small percent of your cost price. Your cost price is driven by your inputs. So what we actually found is that your mechanization is maybe 36% of your cost dropping to 27%. That also means that the whole discussion around farmers saying, yeah, but the interest rate is so high, I can't afford a tractor, is nonsense. The interest rate doesn't kill your business. It's a very small part of your cost. Um, we also found that if you are running your tractor maybe 50% of the time, it's still very profitable to use your tractors and your implements. You don't even need to use them 100% of the time from the first year on. So then we said, okay, we found the right equipment. Seems to be economical to use. There's a business opportunity to sell it, but now how do you introduce this technology in a local environment? 
what type of organization is going to buy this and, and how are they going to use it. Um, and then we actually got to what we call the nucleus farmer. And we found um, a whole bunch of, of farmers here that have maybe 30, 60, 200 acres of, of farmland. And they already tend to service people around them. They may have just bought their first tractor. Um, they're already charging their tractor out to other farmers who pay them for, for plowing their land. Um, and uh, they often offer advice. Sometimes they make their own seed potato and sell it to others. So we came with this concept of the mechanized a nucleus potato farmer who buys one set of equipment uh, that services maybe 80 hectares of potato two to three times per year and he uses 25 percent of the time he uses this on his own land and the rest of the time he charges it out to to others um, and in that concept we calculated it through we did the business case the profit and loss we chose four pilot farmers um, we had our selection criteria for how to select them and um, we then, you know, did the whole profit and loss on it. And basically, you know, that seems to be a good business case. And currently, with that business case, we went to banks to see if they're willing to finance it. And that's where we currently are. They're very interested in financing it. And the next step would be to introduce the technology in a pilot form with four different farmers and see how it goes, see how it performs. Um, and, of course, yeah, the... Um, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. We'll have to see whether this works, whether it is the right technology, uh, whether it is profitable, and how it is going before we can roll it out to others. So, um, yeah, that's basically some, some lessons on potato. Thank you very much.